Good morning, amen. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Romans, chapter number 12 with me this morning, please. Romans 12 and verse number 1. The epistle of the Apostle Paul to the church believers in Rome. The same Rome that sits over there today, 2,000 years later. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, bless your holy word now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to preach to you this morning a message entitled, The Battle for Your Mind. The Battle for Your Mind. The Battle for Your Mind. The mind uses the brain, but the brain's not the mind. The mind's the thinking faculty of your soul. The Greek word for soul is suke. It's that spiritual part of a man that cannot be put under a microscope, can't be examined in a laboratory, but nonetheless it is a reality. The battle for the mind. Most of what is received into your mind today is anti-Christ in nature. Take, for example, your job site. No telling what some of you are working with when you go tomorrow to the job site. What you have to hear, what you have to see. Some of you go home to a family that is antagonistic to the Word of God and to the name of Christ. Some TV is a trash sewer medium. For the most part, has very, very few redeeming qualities. The movie theater, likewise, a place of horrendous... Uh, uh, pornography, filth, and perversion. The news media today is pumping out 24-7. One constant lie after another, all of it based upon rejection of God. The educational system today, as you know as well as I do, is one of the worst places in the world for a young child to be placed, but that's where they go, and the government puts its demand on your children that they be trained and educated by their system. Facebook, for example, is a gossiper's paradise. Facebook can be used for a good thing. Mostly it is for a bad thing. The internet, we have a web page, but folks, the internet is full of filth. It's full of godlessness. The internet is a horrible place if you just get on there and not know where you're going. Twitter, I don't tweet, but do you tweet? Some folks want to tweet on Twitter. I understand that's what they do. I don't read it. I got, I got too much to do to sit on all these sites. Believe me, I do. I can't sit on Facebook and Twitter, and, 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 or Twitter, rather. <laughs> it, just, it just takes up too much time. <laughs> and cell phones. I don't know if you realize they're not today, but a cell phone, takes, it demands your life. There's a whole generation of kids today that when you try to talk to them, they got their cell phone in their hand and they're doing this while they're trying to talk to you at the same time. They won't give you their undivided attention. I call that addiction. I don't know what you call it, but cell phones today, you've got text messages, pictures, video. Occasionally they use them to talk with, but most of these kids today, they don't talk. It's this. It's this, or, or text, or, 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 a, or a message, a video, or a picture of something they're receiving. But in any event, Satan has managed to saturate your life with diversions, information overload, and mindless chatter. Meaningless facts to blind you with overload. You can't take it all in, folks. You can't hear everything that everybody has to say. You can't get involved in everybody's life. There's no way you can keep up with everything that's going on. There are just too many people out there. So you've got to learn to take control of the information that comes in and what you do and your interaction socially with people and with mankind. Most of what you process in your mind today is simply anti-Christ in nature. So what is your escape? What is your refuge? What is your fortress? How do you get away from all of this? What do, you, what do you raise up as a standard against it when it comes against you? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's called the sword of the Spirit. 
Immediately when you think of a sword, you think of something that is a weapon. A sword's not a toy, folks. It's a weapon. And the sword of the Spirit, the Bible said in Ephesians 6.17, is the Word of God. This Bible is a sharp, two-edged sword. It is two-edged. The Bible said in Revelation 1.16 that it is a two-edged sword. In Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse 12, the Scripture says the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the... I don't know of anything else that can do that. The Bible, the Bible tells you that it can read your mind. It can read your heart and it can separate you down to your lowest element. That once the Bible is done with you, there's nothing hidden for the Scripture can open you up like nothing else can. But it also, in Revelation chapter number 19, verse 15, it cuts to the intended target. It is a two-edged sword. Not only does it speak to you, but my friend, it also applies to that one who's coming against you. It is your weapon against the enemy. And make no mistake about it, he is a malevolent enemy. He comes to destroy you, to kill and to steal and to destroy. Satan is a liar. From the very beginning, he's a murderer. And he has no good intent for you whatsoever. He can deceive you into thinking that he is beneficial, that he's good, that what you're doing is helpful, that it's, a, it's approved. But in the end, it biteth like a serpent. It will destroy your very life. Satan, my friend, is a lion. So the Bible says the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And that is what you absolutely must use against the enemy. The Word of God has authority. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 1 and verse 3, And God said, Let there be. Only the words proceeding forth from His mouth was necessary to bring into existence what men are still clamoring today to discover. God made it all by saying, let there be. If the Almighty could speak the universe into existence and yet take time to form you from the dust of the ground, that tells me that you're far more important to God than a star out here somewhere at the end of some galaxy. He knows every tick of your heart. Every movement of your brain, every breath you breathe, every thought that goes through your mind, everything about your being. The Almighty has made provision for you because you're far more important to Him than some nebula, some space, some star, some planet, some whatever out there. It makes no difference. He made the stars also. That's as far as God's concerned. That's all that matters to Him. It's nothing but endless nothing. What matters is the soul of a human being. So the Word of God has authority. Demons tremble at the Word of God. The Bible said the dead come forth when He speaks the Word. And the Scripture says the sick are healed. And my friend, they are and still are. Nothing has changed about His Word. It is the same Word today that it was 2,000 years ago. It is God Almighty's declaration to man. And it is loaded with power. But the unleashing of that power is the key to the victorious Christian life. It is to know how to approach Scripture and your enemy, the devil. It is to know how to deal with these issues that we must, that we must focus today in the Scripture, the Word of God. The Bible says the sword of the Spirit is God's provision for the believer. You use it against your enemy, not flesh and blood. The battle is a spiritual battle. Therefore, the concept of Scripture, the message of the Bible, the thought of the Scripture, all of the nuances in the Bible that sometimes aren't readily apparent, but it's loaded with meaning, are for the spirit of a man. You get the spirit of a man right, everything else will fall in its place. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6, the Bible talks about the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your loins girt about, and all of these other things, and the shield of truth. But it also talks about the sword of the Spirit in Ephesians chapter number 6. The sword of the Spirit, therefore, is drawn to our attention because it is the one part of this panoply of defense that you have in Ephesians 6 that is different from all the rest. 
Because everything that is mentioned in Ephesians 6 is for defense except the sword. The sword undoubtedly is a defensive weapon. You can defend yourself with a sword and make no mistake about it. But primarily a sword is a striking weapon, a thrusting weapon. It is designed to kill the enemy. And you've got to keep that in mind. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, therefore is given it into your hand to know how to assault that one who wants to destroy you. Instead of appealing to your emotions and your intellect and your mind and your ability and what you've accomplished in your life, instead of that, you turn to the sword of the Spirit, the Word of the living God. It is therefore beneficial to you and to me and to every human being on this earth that the more of the Word of God that you've memorized, the more of it that you've hidden in the heart, the more of it that becomes part of your nature, the better equipped you are for the battle that rages around your soul. There is a war, folks. I'm not talking about a skirmish. There is a war going on right now for the souls of men. And the battlefield is the mind. And to know how to deal with this issue is to know how to deal with Satan and to know how to deal with the spiritual forces that are arrayed against you. And make no mistake, they know what they're doing. Do we know what we're doing? They know what their end is. Do you know what your end is? They know who their captain is do you know who your captain is they know where they're going do you know where you're going it is a battle to the death it's not a game it's not a joke they're not playing they will fight you to the very death and they have no mercy they know not mercy they know nothing about mercy when they get to your jugular they'll cut you down and destroy you I've watched men die like that I've watched them throw their life and their family away and then look at themselves in a mirror and say when it's too late, what a fool I've been. So the sword of the Spirit, the tactics, my friend, therefore, are to kill. In 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 8, the Bible says this of the Lord Jesus speaking himself of what he came to do when he came into this world. 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 8. Here's what John said the Lord did. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Notice it didn't come that he might uh, temper the works of the devil, that he might make them null and void. No, he came to destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 14. The divine text says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Here's how it works. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross as the sin offering, paid the sin debt, went down into the place where Satan thought he could bind him and hold him captive. He went into the captivity. But on the third day, because of who he was, he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. And when that happened, the power of Satan was broken. He could no longer hold him. And when that power of death was broken, that power of death is for me, for you, and for everybody on the face of this earth. He destroyed the power of death that Satan had. How do you wield the sword of the Spirit? <laughs> How do you do it? Let's get down to the nuts and bolts of it. Instead of looking at our engine as it whirs and, and it pulls that automobile and does its job, let's take the head off and pull the pistons out and drop the crankshaft. Let's look at the camshaft and the bearings. Let's look at the nuts and the bolts of what it's about. And how do you yield the sword of the Spirit? Number one, you get serious. Some of you are only serious about yourself. You're serious about your own pleasure. You're serious about your life. But you're not serious about your soul. Number two, the Bible says in Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle. We wrestle. Not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness in high places. That word wrestle is the Greek word pale. 2,000 years ago, that word meant this. This is exactly what that word meant. When Paul used it, he chose his words carefully. It means to contend with your foe in a wrestling match and to wrestle to the very point to where you've got him pinned to the ground and you have your hand on his neck. 
You've got his neck pinned down. In plain words, he is brought into complete submission. And there is no question that the victory is yours. That's what God wants for you. That's what he wants for me. He wants us to have victory over our enemy, the devil. Do you have that victory? Do you really have it? There's an area in your life that we call the mind. In Hebrews chapter, in the Romans chapter number 12, it says that the mind can be renewed. The scripture teaches me that when your mind and your heart to begin to embrace your spirit, that you're, begin, that you're ready for battle. When your mind, your heart, and your spirit make up what you are as you go into battle. Now, if you've got a double mind, if you're a double-minded man, you're unstable in all your ways. Satan, if he can get your mind flip here and flop there and think this and think that, and if, especially if he can get you to think that your spiritual life is built upon all the garbage going through your mind, he's got you already. Don't put any trust in your mind. Don't put any faith in your mind. Don't do it. Because the mind is a very, very unstable thing. At one moment your mind may be rejoicing and praising God fixed on scripture. And the next moment wallowing in pornography. One moment your mind may be memorizing the word of God and shouting the victory. And the next moment your mind could be wandering off into hell itself. And you know I'm telling you the truth. That's the mind. You say, preacher, I just can't believe I. That's not I. That's your mind. With the mind, that mind is something that's got to be brought into control. It's the flesh, the fleshly mind. And you've got to bring it into control. And the mind will never bring the mind into control. As I said to you Wednesday night, the mind has a mind of its own. Your mind is incapable of bringing your mind into right thinking. Well, how in the world do you do it, preacher? There is a power greater than your mind. Thanks be unto God today that there is a power far greater than your mind. What's that, preacher? It's the Word of God. The Spirit. The Sword of the Spirit. It's what you must rely upon to bring your mind around to right thinking. When you find your mind drifting off, then quote the Scripture. When you find your mind focused on something it shouldn't be, then quote the scripture. Use the word of God, the sword of the spirit against your own mind. And you'll find that you'll begin to think like the Bible says to think. Think about this now. Your heart can deceive you. First John chapter number three and verse number 20. Somebody said, all I got to do is follow my heart. Don't you trust your heart? In first John chapter number three and verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. I've had so many people say to me, Preacher, if I know my heart, you don't know your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You certainly can't, and I can't know mine. I don't trust my heart. I don't trust my mind. So what do I trust? I trust the only fixed thing on this earth. The only absolute thing there is. The only, the only thing there is to my friend that is without error. It is the word of God. But how do I wield that spirit? That's the key. How do I use that spirit? How do I use this book? This is the sword of the spirit. It is the spirit that giveth life. The words that I say to you, they are spirit and they are truth. Not the literal eating of my flesh, he said. But the spirit of the living God. The letter killeth. But the spirit giveth life. We're spirit beings. We've been born by the spirit of the living God. If you're born again. Something happened to you that changed everything about you. Oh, the old mind still goes back to where it came from. Sometimes your heart deceives you. Sometimes you think you want something. You think you want to do this. But come to find out the spirit's not connected with it. And the spirit is the giving, driving force of your life. The spirit is the essence of who you are. It is the part that makes all the difference in the world. Have you ever heard a man stand up and say the right things with the wrong spirit? You've heard it time and again. You've heard them do the right things with the wrong spirit. The spirit will manifest itself. It will come out. It has to. And the arrogant spirit, the arrogance of spirit, the witchcraft of spirit are the two big ones that are in vogue today. It is that arrogant attitude. It is that know-it-all attitude. It is that selfishness. It is that self 
this person, me. It is that spirit that even though you're trying to serve God and attempt to do the right thing, that spirit is coming out. It's coming forward. It's manifesting itself to the people and the people can see it. You hear somebody, all they say is, I, 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 mark it down. That's what they're thinking about is I. I will destroy you. I will destroy me. But I must have the power of Almighty God. Or there's no other way to do it. So here are the two things. The spirit of pride, arrogance, selfishness, self-centeredness, unbelief, and malice. And you'd be amazed at how all that stuff wraps itself up in religious garb and comes at you. Then there's the spirit of witchcraft, heresy, sensuality, and rebellion. That's everywhere. These are the spirits that reveal themselves in your life. I'm trying to say this to you this morning, if you'll catch what I'm doing. That if you'll identify the enemy and identify the strongholds of the enemy in your life, then you can begin to take hold of what you need to deal with your adversary, the devil. Do you remember there in the wilderness when Satan came to the Lord Jesus? Do you remember after 40 days, he was unhungered, the Bible said? Did you note very carefully that confrontation that took place? When Satan said, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones to bread. You know, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from this temple. If thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God. The Lord Jesus never one time looked back at Satan and said, I am the Son of God. Not one time did he ever do that. When he was confronted with Satan, what did he use against Satan? He made the confrontation, not between Satan and Christ, though Christ is perfect, unlike any, other, unlike any of us. There's nothing in him that Satan could have found, but it was not that. He made the confrontation of Satan with Christ instead of made it into Satan and the Word of God. He brought the Word of God before Satan. Satan had to contend with the living Word of the living God. When he had to contend with the living Word of the living God, he backed off. But note carefully. The Lord Jesus Christ said, The prince of this world cometh and hath no part in me. The reason when he made that statement that he hath no part in me, he wanted him to understand. There is nothing in me that he can put his finger on to condemn me, to accuse me before the Father. There's no stronghold in my life. There's no door in my soul. There's nothing that he can gain entrance to. Not so with us. Not so with us. When our adversary, the devil, comes after us to sift our mind, to sift us, to destroy us, he knows your weaknesses. He knows every sin you've committed. He knows exactly what to deal with. He knows where to put his finger, to what button to push, what he needs to do to destroy you. And so what do you do? You say, well, I'll just go against devil. I'll go against Satan. I'll cast him out. I'll do this and I'll do that. He'll let you cast him out. You will think you cast him out. He'll let you get more pride about your spiritual warfare and your ability. He'll play games with you like you wouldn't believe until you've made up your mind that you have some great authority over Satan that you really don't have. And then when he gets ready to, he'll come back at you with seven worse than he left with. And when he comes back, you'll be in worse shape than you were to start with. I've seen people run up and down these floor right here shouting and praising God and glorifying God. And now they're fornicating. And they're lying drunk. Don't get puffed up. For you could be doing the same thing right now. What's going to keep me from it, preacher? Knowing the essence of the battle. The war that we fight. Satan comes against me. I get on my knees. I start praying. He said, now, remember now, son. Let me tell you a little bit about what you used to do. Let me tell you about what went through your mind the other day. Here, listen carefully to me. Let me talk to you about this. Now, here's the way to deal with that. And when he starts reasoning with your mind and talking to you, and you're on your face before God, and you're trying to talk to the Lord, and you're trying to draw close to God, and all this garbage is going through you, and you can get frustrated and throw your hands up in the air and say, what's the use? Or you can quote the scripture back to him and say, I know where I came from, Satan, but I am not what I used to be. By the grace of God, I've been born again. Satan, you're a, you're a liar, Satan. 
you are a condemned foe, Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ carried my sin to the cross and washed me in his precious blood. And by quoting the word of God and embracing scripture, my mind is going to be renewed. I'll renew that mind. It'll renew my thinking faculties. It'll put the battle in focus before me. It'll show me who my enemy is. And I'll tell you one thing that you'll have to do or you'll never be able to gain victory. And you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to confront Satan with the word of God and not you. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking that you're big or you're a big shot or you're some great thing. Oh, I know people bow before you. But most of the time when people lick your boot, it's because they got a reason for licking your boots. Most of the people who run around and call you big names and hang stuff on your shoulders and give you accolades and all the rest of this stuff. They're self-serving. They're just like you are. And you know they are. And you can tell it in your soul. And you, what does it do for your faith? But when you come before God, come to him honestly. Ask him to reveal to you what's in your heart. Ask him to show you what's in your heart. And then when he shows you what's in your heart, confess it to the Lord. When you've confessed it to God, it's taken care of. For he's faithful and just to forgive you. And then when Satan comes against you, use the sword of the Spirit and say, Satan, I've been forgiven. Quote the word of God to him. It's not Baptists don't preach like this. <laughs> Most Baptists preach like it's a finished affair. You've been born again. No man can pluck you from the Father's hand. Let's sail on into glory. None of us are perfect, you know. We got a few warts and bumps. That's okay. We're all going to the same place. Glory to God. Thank God for eternal security. Now sit down your eternal security and have a good time while you're here on this earth. That's the message you get from a lot of Baptist churches. That's a lie straight out of hell. Examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It didn't say work for your salvation. It said work it out. If you've been born again, there are marks of a true believer. We are created into Christ Jesus unto good works. My trust is not in eternal security. My trust is in Christ. And I've got to learn how to trust him every day. I've got to learn how to appropriate him every living moment. I've got to learn how to love him and exalt him and adore him. And he's my God. I've got to do that every day. Amen. You cannot live by a doctrine. You must live by a personal living relationship with the Son of God. Do I believe in eternal security? Absolutely. You know why I believe in it? Because I know humanity, and if you tell the truth, you know it too. There's not a soul walking the face of this earth that's perfect. None of you that think you're keeping the law of God and that you're perfect and you're going to make it to heaven one day because you know, sir, let me wake you up this morning. Let me tell you something. He that says he has no sin is what? So don't throw your hands up and just quit because of that statement. Let that drive you to your knees. Let it drive you to your knees and humble you with a real desire for him because I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to glory. I've done found out something. I know it firsthand, knew it scripturally, now I know it firsthand. It's just you and God when it comes down to that last moment in your life. Are you ready? Just you and the Lord. I want to go to heaven. How are you going to get there, preacher? Jesus. That's easy. That's the easy part. I'll tell you real fast how I'm going to heaven. Jesus. Jesus. Not something that somebody told me happened to me 40, 50 years ago down the road. Somebody in Bible school led me to the Lord or somebody prayed a sinner's prayer with me or I prayed some prayer 50, 60 years ago. No! Who is Jesus right now in your soul? Is he your living Savior? Is he your Lord God Almighty? Or have you just been living a lie all these years? When the Lord Jesus confronted Satan because Satan confronted him. The Lord did not seek out Satan. Satan sought him out. The Lord Jesus was not looking for the devil. The devil was looking for him. If you don't get anything else from the message this morning, please get this. Here was the sinless, perfect Son of God who said there is none good but the Father. When he was here on this earth 2,000 years ago, he did not confront Satan on his own merit. 
he was, he was going through a period of probation and testing to prove after a sinless, perfect life that he was who he said he was, that he would be accepted into heaven on the merits of his own righteousness, and he was, that God exalted him to his right hand, glory to God, because he is the sinless, perfect Son of God, proven to be that by the life that he lived. Therefore, when Satan came against him, he did not exalt himself against the devil. He quoted the word of God. If the Lord Jesus Christ chose to quote scripture against his adversary, the devil, who am I? Because friend of mine, I ain't perfect. Who am I to think that I have earned some kind of authority where I can take myself against Satan. No, I'll quote the Bible. I'll wield the sword of the Spirit. And I'll finish with this this morning. Do you believe the Bible? I believe it. And I love it. This is a precious book, folks. Precious, precious, precious book. Precious book. Precious, precious. I just got through with Romans again. Romans is a good book. But so is Hebrews. <laughs> so is 1 <First> Corinthians. <laughs> I love Galatians. <laughs> Ephesians is an awful good book. <laughs> Philippians, Colossians. Just turn anywhere, it's all good. <laughs> Quote that to him, not out of the heart of a hypocrite, but out of the heart of a believer. He'll have no more issues with you. Father, in thy name we pray. In Jesus' sake, I ask it. Lord, I've stood for you again. Lord, I pray that I please you. And I glorify your holy name, Savior. And God, you know, Lord, that I know that it's not about me. They've just heard the messenger this morning. That's all I am. I'm just the messenger. But now, Lord, it's between them and you. It's not what that preacher lost, and it's about them and you. And I hope, I pray, Lord, and hope that it helps some folks. I hope they get help. I hope, I hope some folks in here have been struggling and battling and never really understood the nature of the battle. Now they're beginning to understand it. They begin to see it. Maybe through Christ and what he went through between him and Satan, they can begin to understand now the nature of the real battle, the war that's being fought. In Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Let's stand up and sing, brother. Page 375 in your all there. <laughs> Listen to me, please. We make a big mistake, a grave error in listening to each other too much. Read this book and listen to it. It'll talk to you. This book will always lead you to God. Sing another verse. To come. Blessed be the God and Father. Of our Lord Jesus Christ, bless His holy name. Bless His holy name. Hallelujah to God. No, boy, no, no, no. It's not my place to convict or condemn anybody. That's the work of God. I'm the messenger. I'm comfortable with that part. That's what I'm called to do. 
I'll leave the one that searches the heart, tries the reins, divides you up to what you are. I'll let him talk to you. <laughs> Amen. That takes a huge load off me. Sing another verse, brother. Just the messenger, folks. I'm happy at that. Just the messenger. Oh, Lamb of God. Yes, sir. Sister Brewer quoted a little while ago, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Yeah. Do you know who said that? Do you know who said that in the Old Testament? It's right before some towns were vaporized with fire from heaven. That ought to pinpoint it. Abraham, the father of the faithful, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? What about the righteous over here in the city, God said? He'll do right. He'll do right. He'll do right. He'll do right, folks. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Oh, yes. Think of it, folks. When God became a man, that man produced a righteousness that did not exist till he lived a sinless, perfect life on this earth for 33 and one half years. That righteousness got him back into heaven, and that righteousness is seated at the right hand of God, and that righteousness is given to you the very moment you're born again. <laughs> Not having my own righteousness, the apostle said. No way. <laughs> Forget me. Righteousness of a sinless, perfect man. God's in here, like you folks said earlier. He's in here. He was in here in worship. Now he's in here in conviction. And some of you have heard something this morning that's got you thinking. Well, that's good. I would as you go home this afternoon and do some thinking on it. Think about it. Think about it. Think about the confrontation of evil and righteousness, yet the righteous one quoted Scripture in their confrontation. Scripture. And what did Satan do when scripture was quoted to him? Nobody can stand before the word of God. Uh, Jeremiah 9, 22 and 23. Well, 9, 23, yeah. Thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah 9. 23 and 24, 22. Speak thus saith the Lord, even the carcasses of men shall fall as dung upon the open field and as the handful after the harvestmen and none shall gather them. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. I can read this next one. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Amen. Bless his holy name. Amen. Bless the name. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> I don't get righteousness from a man. I don't get judgment from a man. I don't get peace from men. But him, yes. Amen. Yes. And you can too. Amen. You can too. Amen. All right. This is a different service here this morning. 
I don't really quite know what to do. We got, a, we got a brother that wants to be anointed. Would you come up here to the front? We'll anoint you right now. Anybody like to come out down the front? Here, here he is, right here. <laughs>